I'm honored to introduce today's keynote. When we invited Ben Davis uh, to speak at, at Superscript, we were drawn both to his political sensibility and his engaging and accessible uh, criticism for publications including Art Papers, Freeze, The Village Voice, Slate, and Artnet News, where he serves as national art critic. Um, we also love the ideas in his 2013 book, seen here, 9.5 Theses on Art and Class, um, Haymarket Press, um, which was hailed, by the way, by New York Times critic Holland Cotter for its smart, ardent, illusion-puncturing observation and analysis on the intersection of art, commerce, and the elephant in the art, art fair VIP lounge class. But little did we know there were other reasons to invite him. He's one of us. Ben did his undergraduate degree at McAllister College in nearby St. Paul, Minnesota. And during that time, I've learned he was a docent right here at the Walker Art Center. So welcome back to your adopted hometown, perhaps. Um, OK, so I'm, ex I'm particularly excited about his keynote today. Um, as he's using his time on the superscript stage, not just to sort of trot out some prefab conference uh, talk that he does all across the country at colleges and universities, he's using his time here to plant a flag of sorts. He'll be using his time on stage to name, define, and dig into what he calls post-descriptum criticism. And of course, you'll have plenty of time to explain what that means. We hope it's the beginning of, a, of his further investigations um, online and maybe in another book um, long after Superscript. And we hope you all come back to read the seminal, uh, see the seminal video that was launched right here at Superscript 20, 2015. So please help me welcome Ben Davis. Thank you, sir. Can, every, can people hear me? Yes. Uh, how's everybody feeling? Good, you're ready. Well, uh, fasten your seatbelts is an epic talk. Um, so there I am. Uh, this makes it look very official that I have something to say. So I'm going to try and deliver. So that was a, that was a very uh, generous and kind uh, introduction. And I do have to say that... Um, it is a real rush for me to be back here. Uh, people always ask you, wherever you go, you know, how you became an art critic, and there is no really good answer for that. There are so many starting points, but one starti possible starting point I can think of is right here at the Walker, where I was not just a tour guide. I didn't just go through the docent training program, but I was a tour guide for kids, which is a particular kind of thing and a particular kind of challenge. So you come out of college and you're full of all these heady ideas of what art is. This is a Robert Rauschenberg from the Walker's um, collection. And you know probably that how to talk about this is neo-dada art or uh, proto-pop art. It's about appropriation. It's about a collage. But when kids look at it, what kids see um, is a big mess. It's a big, exciting mess. And that's why they like it. And that's, and that's a totally different way of looking at it. And that is, I think everyone should have that experience of trying to have to explain art on that level. And in a way, it, inf it has informed the way I approach and write about art. And it informs some of the ideas in this talk today about the relationship of image to text. So there it is, uh, a text slide for a talk about images. Uh, and I should say, I, I'm, I'm a visual art critic, and I spent many years giving talks without images until I, I actually had an intellectual epiphany that that was a bit of a paradox or a contradiction, that what we do is very visual. But I'm, so the, the talk is post-descriptive uh, criticism. The concept I want to present is post-description. And I have to say at the outfit set that I am almost a little embarrassed by the subject by that subject. I have very specific reasons that I chose it for this talk and for you. But it's a kind of a, I think it's almost like a, a, it's kind of a this technical concept that I think to some of you is going to be like head scratchingly, uh, cringingly obvious. And to some of you, on the other hand, it's going to be uh, a little bit repugnant and almost like everything you stand uh, against. And it, the idea is very simple, essentially, and, and as they say, technical, that uh, most of the way that we think about writing about art has been formed um, in times of relative image scarcity, that is, in, in, in a print culture. And since this is a, a conversation about digital um, culture and its effect on art writing, uh, the digital world, particularly now, is one of relative image plenty, and that, that may change, and I think is changing, uh, s the way we think about what an art critic can or should do. Before I go on, I want to say 
two things, two particular things uh, about this argument. And the first is I'm making uh, an aesthetic argument and not an epistemological argument. That is, I'm, I'm interested in, I'm not interested in here totally in having an argument about whether or not images totally capture the reality of an artwork or can or should or if words do um, or, uh, you know, what I'm interested in, this is sort of more pragmatic. I think it's true that images are more engaging. They're a more engaging way to describe um, an object. And this chain of thought started for me really with the practical experience, as I told Paul when he asked me what I was doing here, um, of working, in, uh, of working in digital media for 10 years as a writer, critic, and editor. And there is just a pragmatic reality that art criticism, which is in some ways the, the crown jewel of art writing, doesn't do that well. You know, the monographic art review measured by traffic doesn't, it can't justify itself against news or um, opinion. I mean, it really is, uh, uh, it really is the kind of laggard. And so I started thinking about what is it? Are there habits that we need to break? Are there new things that we need to do? And maybe visual art criticism should be a lot more visual than it is. Maybe we're inheriting patterns of writing and thinking that we need to rethink. And the second thing I want to say by the talk that I think is important is that it's, it's descriptive, not prescriptive. That is, this is already happening. I'm not saying this, we should do this. I'm saying that people are already writing in a new way and, and, and thinking about images and, and text in a new way. People in this room are. And uh, what I am saying is I don't, I don't think that's been, that's totally theorized or thought out yet. I think that it bears more thought um, and deliberation than we've given that problem so far, or that I've given it so far. You know, this is my attempt to think it through for myself in a certain sense. So why is this a big deal, you know, if, if, it, if ideas of description in, 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 in change? Well, um, first of all, because description is the cornerstone. If you take a class on art, on writing about art, it is, it is, it is the corner, and there are such things exist, it is the cornerstone of what you'll be taught. Is the good art criticism is good description. Uh, it is the first thing my first editor said to me is clear description is the most important thing. And this is a very recent guide to writing about art, but it's the very first thing that she says you need to do is, is, is clear description. Um, and that's, that, the meaning of that, we're moving into a, a world where that, those terms are different. Even as I was planning this um, presentation, I saw a friend of mine, a colleague, Martha Schwendner, who writes for the New York Times, posted on Facebook. This is uh, Michael Kimman's review of the New Whitney. And she already, as I was planning, said, described this as a post-descriptive review. And I think it's, it's just to give a sense of the world we're moving into, I think it's important to just take a look at this. And so it's important enough that I'm actually going to click out of my own um, the prison of PowerPoint to show you what it looks like. So here um, you have a big, uh, a big, uh, I think you guys may be taking over the bandwidth, but you have a big, enormous <laughs> image. <laughs> there are glitches in this new world. And then you have uh, re uh, big, uh, big pieces of, of large text, and you have these like animated graphics um, giving you um, a sense of the geography, zooming you around here, flying over the city. Um, you arrive at the new museum, then more text. Then you have this amazing graphic where you fly into the new Whitney through this two-dimensional woman, look out through the window, <laughs> and it transforms magically into to real New York, um, and you get a sense of the view, and then, there's, and then it goes on like this. Here you have this sort of strange serial killer-like tracking shot taking you through the new installation, <laughs> and on and on and on. Um, now, uh, as interesting as that is, I would say that I think it's still relatively primitive. Um, as absorbing as those graphics are, I think if you read what's going on there, it still essentially reads like a text that was written separately from the images that there was a text written about this, Kimmelman's text, and then they layered a bunch of very elaborate graphics into it. So there's two, there are really two ways of, 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 of thinking about what the critic is doing there in one place. And I think that there are these times, here we are, it's, it's a little bit, uh, 
Yeah, there we go. There are these times in art history where you do see there's, there are two systems of thought that, coincide, that, that collide with each other. So in the early Renaissance, for a long period, for instance, people were, um, were learning to use perspective, but they were still painting halos on figures in these two-dimensional flat forms so that um, the halos blocked the, the view of the people behind them. So you can see two systems of thought, or in the early days of photography, um, pictorialism, you know, people thought when photography was being thought about as art, they thought you had to make it like um, paintings. They had to make unique prints and treat the surface in a very painterly way. And these forms are, um, have charms of their own, there's, there's charm, but you can definitely see two different forms of thinking wrestling with each other. And my argument is that is the kind of, of world that we have been writing in on the internet about art up not up until now, because I think there's, it's an evolving form, but I definitely I think there's, there's, there are new forms of thinking that are occurring. And it would be, after all, very strange if we had thought through all the implications of thinking uh, or writing about art on the internet. After the internet's not that old, um, this is the New York Times admitting the word to film, the verb to film, into the vocabulary, this vocabulary a, a quarter century after the invention of film. And they essentially say, well, uh, people are using it, we've got to use it, but we think this film thing is probably a fad. It's peaking. <laughs> they say, the vogue of the moving pictures is surely at its height um, and will last until the great actors return to the stage. So, um, uh, it's just some history. Now, now I want to do a little history on the history of this problem. Um, so, the rhetorical name for... Uh, there's a Greek word, ekphrasis, that is the, 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 what we do, where, the, the, where art criticism, the idea of art criticism um, as uh, describing works of art come from. The literary description of a visual work of art, the attempt to evoke its properties, is called ekphrasis. And that's a Greek word, but the thing, of course, is the Greeks didn't have, um, uh, didn't have exact images of the world. Pliny the Elder, in this, in this passage, you know, he argues that um, there in, when it came to botanical art, they just couldn't get it good enough to be scientifically accurate, so they fell back into, into descriptions of the world. And that became their defe default way, and then that didn't prove to be exact enough either, and it really hampered their knowledge uh, of medicine. And we, of course, it's the origins of the concept, but we live in a different world. I, I like to point out the, the, the art criticism as we know it, um, which we trace to the probably... Um, really get, picks up steam there in the 19th century. Um, uh, I like to point out that the figures, the big figures of, of art criticism in this peri period, Charles Baudelaire in France, or John Ruskin in, um, in, uh, in, in, in England, both would have been, they all would have been in the same high school class with Marx and Engels. Like, they were born at the same time. So conscious, the consciousness, this, this is, art criticism is born of a capitalist world, of a fast-changing capitalist world where standards of taste are changing and you need someone to step in, um, just as the criticism of modern art is born at the same time as the criticism of capitalism. And all the industrial things that come out of capitalism, photography being among them, form new ways of thinking, most notably art history is a product of the invention of the illuminated slide lantern. You can't have a real art historical thinking, art historical pedagogy without the ability to have photos that compare things. Nevertheless, images until the last quarter of the 19th century were relatively rare, um, and uh, criticism was, was steeped in ekphrasis. And here is a classic example from John Ruskin, which I'll read to you in its entirety. Um, this is about uh, a Turner painting, uh, The Slave Ship. It is a sunset on the Atlantic after a prolonged storm. But the storm is partially lulled, and the torn and streaming rain clouds are moving in scarlet lines to lose themselves in the hollow of the night. The whole surface of the sea included in the picture is divided into two ridges of enormous swell, not high nor local, but a low, broad heaving of the whole ocean, like the lifting of its bosom by deep-drawn breath after the torture of the storm. Between these two ridges, the fire of the sunset falls along the trough of the sea, dyeing it with an awful but glorious light, the intense and lurid splendor of which burns like gold and bathes like blood. Along the fiery path and valley, the tossing waves by which the swell of the sea is restlessly divided lift themselves in dark, indefinite, fantastic forms, each casting a faint and ghastly shadow behind it along the illuminated foam. 
They do not rise everywhere, but three or four together in wild groups, fitfully and furiously, as the understrength of the swell compels or permits them, leaving between them treacherous spaces of level and whirling wild, now lighted with green and lamp-like fire, now flashing back the gold of the declining sun, now fearfully dyed from above with the indistinguishable images of the burning clouds which fall upon them in flakes of crimson and scarlet, and give to the reckless waves the added motion of their own fiery flying, purple and blue. The lurid shadows of the hollow breakers are cast upon the mist of the night, which gathers cold and low, advancing like the shadow of death upon the guilty ship as it labors amidst the lightning of the sea, its thin mass written upon the sky in lines of blood, girded with condemnation in the fearful hue, which signs, signs the sky with horror and mixes its flaming flood with the sunlight, and cast far along the desolate heave of the cephical waves in Carnadine's the multitudinous sea. <laughs> they do not write criticism like that anymore. It's beautiful, evocative. It attempts through the force of rhetoric to evoke the intensity of this, uh, the experience of this painting. It is clearly, it is a dense and difficult and complex involved passage. It's clearly the product of a culture where people would spend, oh, I don't know, uh, three to five hours listening to a political speech. That was a normal thing and where Shakespeare was popular entertainment and not, uh, and not, uh, not, uh, not uh, boutique entertainment. So, uh, but nevertheless, it is beautiful, it is amazing, it is a work of art in itself, and nevertheless, I doubt that any of you, unless you know this painting, actually have an image of it in your head right now. And this does that job far better. And here's a detail, and there's another detail, and there's another detail. Um, so, there's a lot to say about what happened with, uh, pictures, uh, with photos, with art writing in the last half of the 19th century, the earliest 20th century, but I'm actually most interested for the purposes of this talk with how recent, really, the dramatic changes in how we think about, uh, think about um, what art, art, how art writing relates to, to images is. So I went back to, I went to the New York Public Library and I found old issues, the oldest issues I could find um, that seemed to be within seems to me to be legible as, a, as an art magazine. And so this is the Art News Annual from 1956. And uh, on the inside, uh, inside flap, the interesting thing is color plates, they advertise these color plates here. Um, every color plate is like, is like they advertise it. It's like a really special thing that there are color plates in this, at this period. And when you go into the end, when the editor's note, he emphasizes what a luxuriant thing it is and how what a new thing it is. They have um, exciting color plates and how that makes this particularly um, uh, a luxury product, the really exciting product you have in your hand. Here's what it looks like inside. Still a lot of black and white illustrations, but then these uh, glossy inset photos. Now, uh, 1962 is an important year in magazine history in, in the United States. Uh, National Geographic in February 1962 becomes the first all-color magazine published in the United States. Same year, 1962, June 1962, Art Forum publishes its first issue in, uh, in San Francisco, later to move to Los Angeles, then New York. And this is that first issue. Here's what it looked like on the inside. Um, ads in black and white. There's the table of contents. Here's the opening critical, critical salvo. Critics pondering then as they do now, why are we doing this? And uh, here's, here's a passage. You can see here he lays out the tasks of art criticism. Uh, and there's our old friend description, the very first thing that he mentions. There is the descriptive task, that of telling what the work looks like, a most difficult exercise in objectivity, as well um, absolutely would be, given that this is what the layout of the reviews looks like. So you have these on the left hand, uh, always separate. On the left hand, you have these um, fairly inscrutable, low quality black and white reproductions of the art being talked about. And then on the right side, these dense blocks of text. And then more of that with the same images on a facing page. And then a lot of stuff that's like this. Um, so you as you can imagine, uh, description, uh, uh, not just uh, uh, an absolute necessity there, if you if you have if you have if you want to like evoke what an art the visual experience of a work of art. Now, leaping ahead ten years 
1972 is uh, the year of John Berger's, uh, the British Art Career's John Berger's classic seminal ways of seeing documentary on BBC. Now, this is an important reference to me, and I'm actually just idly curious how many people in this audience have seen or read ways of seeing. Almost everybody. It's, you're, that's great. You're, you're a great crowd. Um, <laughs> So it says right there on the cover, seeing comes before words. It's the very first, the very, very first words of the book version of Ways of Seeing, famous first words of, of Ways of Seeing. Um, and yet, the interesting thing about the book is that, right, the images in it are quite bad. They're, they're, it's all about looking and the excitement of the image. Um, and actually, in, for that matter, he talks a lot about the ideological impact of the introduction of color photography, and yet the book itself is, is, is quite poorly illustrated, actually. And there's a reason for that, uh, a good reason, actually, is that um, Berger was committed to, to making it cheap and accessible to the widest number of people. And in this period, there's still a pretty hard opposition between detailed uh, color images and which would make it much more expensive, or less accessible, and, and, and this, these kind of um, reproductions. Jumping ahead another 10 years, back with our old friend Art Forum. I don't mean to pick on Art Forum, I just, uh, uh, I just find it, uh, it's, just a, it's just a convenient object of study that, that represents a specific way of thinking about art, but um, here it is. Here's the, um, what it looks like on the inside. Uh, the ad's now in color. Here's the reviews. The review's still in black and white. Um, and uh, the images have moved off of a facing page and are now on the same page with the text, um, but they're still siloed up there. They're, they're in their own space that floats sort of above the text um, throughout the back of the book reviews, and this is what that looks like. And then there's plenty of pages still, 1982, that look like this. Cut forward again, uh, another decade or so, um, and this, this is actually what the thing that most blew me away about. This is after I graduated from college, after I worked at the Walker. This is, what, this is actually what art form looked like, I guess, when I started professionally writing about art. And you have much more colorful illustrations. Um, this is the front of the reviews. You have a clear hierarchy where the important reviews by the important writers are colorfully illustrated, and then shortly thereafter, there's the ditch where they put the uh, less important reviews with the, um, the less vibrant illustrations, much less vibrant illustrations. And um, you can see that uh, the uh, text is encroaching a little bit more on the image as well, but it's still basically the same thing. It's sometime in the middle. As far as I can tell, I haven't actually looked at exactly the moment, but it's in the middle of the 2000s when Art Forum goes all color. This is two years later, Paul Chan's on the cover, a great Paul Chan on the cover. And this is what it looks like. Um, you have these inset tiled images that are now actually, they're, they're in color throughout, and they're actually much more integrated into the text, um, but still relatively discreet, right? Um, and, and modest. <coughs> Now, um, and so, and that really is the trajectory, right? You go from low quality to high quality, um, essentially, in some sort of way, and you go from separate images thought of as completely separate to image being more and more um, embedded in the text. Now, at the same time, all this happened, of course, this other little thing is happening, uh, the internet. <laughs> and uh, is, 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 is becoming a thing. Uh, this is the magazine I worked for for many years, Artnet Magazine, um, which is, depending on how you count it, the first or one of the first online art magazines. You talk about different systems colliding. Here's, here's what it looked like in 1997 when it was launched. This is a review of the Whitney Biennial. You have this great typewriter font, clearly designed to make the web look like a, sort of a typewritten thing. And, and for that matter, it's called a magazine. It's presented as a magazine. Uh, it's not, uh, it's not, you know, this is, I think, well before the term blog even existed. Ten years later, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is me reviewing the 2006 Whitney Biennial complaining about the use of text, how <laughs> the labels were out of control, there was too much text mediating your experience of the art. And this is me two years later um, reviewing the, 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 the Whitney Biennial in 2008. Um, now, when I look at back this now, and this is, keep in mind, this is not that long ago. Uh, this is, this is uh, what, seven years ago? When I, when I look at it, it just, it's almost like looking at another world. It's hard for me to even imagine uh, putting together uh, uh, an article like this. For one thing, <laughs> for one thing this, the title is crazy to me. 
rave on. What does that mean? I look at my own archive now, and I remember vividly being at Artnet Magazine and uh, having consultants who would come in and say, you know, it would really help you if um, you put, like, the word Picasso in the title. It would be really helpful for an article about Picasso. And we were like, well, we're not going to name the article. There's a new Picasso show at MoMA. It doesn't make any sense. But now that's exactly what you have to do. And everybody has sentence-style headlines, declarative headlines, because that helps. Uh, it's very important um, with Internet search. And then the other thing, and this will... This Artnet magazine was already a technical dinosaur at this point, but this may this is I think akin to some of you of uh, of who were grown up with blogging, sophisticated blogging platforms, is saying that we we crank this out with a chisel uh, on stone. Is that we didn't have any sort of back end CMS in order to content management system in order to do this stuff. We produce we wrote this stuff in Microsoft Word, and then handed it to a designer who then put it online for us. And uh, same with the images. The images were processed separately. So you get these two columns. You get a very well illustrated, actually. You get these, a column of images and column of text. But we had no control over the design, and those things were taught about, thought about totally separately. And that's where things stood in 2008. And I'm not going to actually, I'm not going to, we'll get to some examples of what's going on now later. Um, but I just want you, I just want to emphasize how recently it was that, that people, me included, um, still were thinking about the a web in a relatively um, print-based way, you know, as if we're just taking what we do on the, on, uh, in a print magazine and putting it online, and that's the key axis of what we do. So, part two. Uh, so, the interesting thing, an interesting thing for me about this um, topic is that this is not a political topic. Like, as... In my introduction, I said, you know, I, my book is about uh, class and, and, and political art. So this is not a political um, topic, not really. Um, it has political dimensions. But um, on the other hand, I think there would probably be less argument about it if I were doing a political. I think there would be more consensus about it. I think that, I think that um, talking about, uh, you know, uh, whether or not we need to describe um, works of art uh, or we should just use pictures, actually touches some pretty like key nerves for people because the peop very core to how people think about what they do as art writers. So this is my former boss, Walter Robinson, when he when the superscript tweeted the, uh, tweeted the, um, the topic, the subject of my talk out, and this is him responding. Uh, sorry, buddy, writing about art is thinking about art and begins with looking and describing, and he's, he's certainly um, somewhat right about that. Um, so, but I just want to, now I want to touch... Uh, through a couple of theoretical touchstones, you know, talk, think about a little bit about why, why this is such a, you know, um, what are the what are the kind of resonances of this that it makes it such a such a touchy touchy issue at this particular moment, um, as I think it is. I wrote, yeah, last year I, probably one of the most read things that I have ever done is an article I wrote last year about Instagram, where I took because people care an awful lot more about Instagram as a means of expression than art. But um, I, took, I took John Berger's theories about how, theories, how classical art and modern-day advertising images work in similar and different ways and applied that to, applied that to um, the way images function on Instagram. And this it became a very big uh, hit for me. Got picked up all kinds of places, including um, the entourage actor, Adrian Grenier, uh, reposted this uh, visual comparison I did between Kim Kardashian and a Spanish, a Spanish uh, nude, and, uh, and and reposted it on his Instagram, saying uh, railing against inequality, and this became a kind of celebrity news story that went a long, long ways, and became a big enough thing actually that me and some colleagues from work got invited into the Instagram offices where they wanted to pick our brains about um, ideas for stories. So here I wrote a Marxist critique of Instagram. <laughs> They invite me in to talk about um, stories. And one of the things that staggered me, one of the things that, st that, I thought was, that was flabbergasting that they, s they said to me is very casually, they said, um, well, one thing uh, that we want you to know is that you don't need staff photographers anymore. Uh, uh, there's no reason to hire a photographer anymore. Um, all you have to do is, is make a hashtag if you do an event, and then uh, all, it's all free on there. As long as you know where to find it, you just like harvest the bounty of Instagram um, for, for your, your, your uses. Um, and I think, so 
this, there's a lot of angst about being a writer at this talk about, at this conference about art writing, but you know, spare a thought for the photographers because um, as a profession that's dising, uh, disappearing pretty fast, um, this is the, uh, two years ago, um, Liberation, the uh, French paper published an image, uh, an issue uh, with completely without images, to, in solidarity with photojournalists saying this is a profession that's going away, precisely being, uh, crowdsourced, turned into an amateur thing, photographers are being given iPhone, uh, writers are being given iPhones, and so on. This is what their culture section looked like without images. And actually, I found out on, about this on this, I think, very good podcast called This Week in Photo um, that I listened to. It had actually a very good discussion of the implication of this, maybe better than anything I've heard written about it from the point of view of writing, but written about the, the, the implication of the change of the Im image from the point of view of photographers. This guy, Alex Lindsay, says, um, there's an evolution we are looking at. It is not that photojournalism per se is gone, but the photojournalism as the only thing you do is gone. The interesting thing is that most of us who are bloggers, we naturally write, take photos, think, think about those articles, figure out what we are going to do. We are moving from one type of media journalist to another type, a media journalist that is going to be able to take those photos, they're going to be able to get really good at photography, but they're also going to understand how to do creative writing and narrative writing and news journalism, and it'll be one person who understands that. And then uh, Frederick Van Johnson, who's the host of the show, coins this term, the multimediographer, which is a pretty lousy term, but expresses something. Um, uh, expresses something accurately. So there's been a process by which images have become, uh, which were once extreme luxuries, like Art News was advertising them as this really special thing, and become so um, ubiquitous and cheap, become so pulped that you actually, um, we live now where like things are becoming just one expressive medium that you kind of like, you pick you pick different things just to express one continuous thought. You're sort of just like collaging together different um, types of expression, or, and, and it's all one form of writing or expression. That's, that's the way I interpret this concept of the multimediographer. Now, there is a reason why, um, I, I think one of the reasons why there's you know, the long history of art criticism being about the 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 the, the desire, you know, the uh, celebrating the image as a as a as a as a absorbing celebrating the absorption property of the image. But there's also a long, an important critical tradition, theoretical tradition of 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 thinking about how to dispel the absorption of the image. I think there's one reason why people, you know, they feel this as an invasion. Um, in 1957, Roland Barthes writes Mythologies, you know, where he talks about how it's a, it's a he talks about that there's a political there's a political analogy analysis of the way images work in in, in society of uh, in French society in that time, and talks about how the language of power is what he calls mythology to take one s one thing out of context and fill it up with another meaning, and make it become the natural, as if it were naturally signified something else. So, and one of the examples he uses is precisely this um, magazine cover uh, um, from 1957 of this uh, young uh, black soldier saluting, presumably the French flag. And he points out, there's like, well, so there's obviously uh, uh, one meaning of this, there's a clear meaning of this, which is a real person. But on the other hand, it is clearly being made to do service for another for another thing. The, the message of this is really clearly a whole other mythology about the French nation. How the French nation is an empire, it's a great empire, but it's a progressive empire, and all serve under it e equally, and um, it discriminates against nobody. And this is Myth Today, which is the text that comes, it's a fairly genteel text. This is a very political point, though. It's happening in 1957 when the, Fran uh, the French uh, occupation of Algeria is coming undone. It's quite bloody conflict. The Battle of Algiers, if you've seen it, this is the time period that that is set in. So the point is, is that this is all about how through images, power naturalizes itself. And Roland Barthes sees the job of the mythologist, that's what he calls... Um, uh, the, the person to, who unpacks these and debunks these things as kind of using language to take you out of the, your natural enrapturement with these things, with all the ideologies that have been stuffed in them. Now, that was a pretty, uh, I think, uh, I think it was a pretty, uh, let's see if this is gonna, I don't know if this 
my looping animated GIF is gonna is gonna go here. But um, the point is that um, that uh, in in uh, in uh, well, we'll just I, the point is I think this is a very form. I think because images have become so um, become so present now. You know, this was a new thing. This is a, a, a color photography, color magazine is a relatively new thing in 1956. Now we like s swarm with them. So people are very image savvy. Actually, the average person is a very for common form of writing um, where people take a little piece of pop culture out of context and then uh, caption it in such a way that it like becomes an allegory for things. And this is like, uh, this is like a kind of like people's mythology in action. You know, this is a very, like the point is, is that what was, the, if the project in Barstay was sort of a debunking, um, I think now people are actually sort of naturally cynical about the image and constantly recontextualizing things. This is my favorite example of, I guess, a, um, a contemporary mythology, this is hipster cop. From from Occupy Wall Street it was this like um, police officer who had skinny ties and skinny jeans and uh, was was kind of a darling of the media and I, obviously this is functions exactly as a as a mythology in Barth's sense you know he's a real guy he really dresses like that but he becomes a media sensation because he represents the kind of funny side of power it's like is it all so bad these guys are just like these guys are just like uh, funny wacky hipsters and this guy knows it he's interviewed in GQ he talks about the the semiology of his his fashion and his clothing, clothing, and of course, people responded to this immediately with a variety of memes. <laughs> so I love, you know, you could talk all about the idiocy of the image, but I mean, people are savvy enough to be natural mythologists in Barth's sense. Are constantly, d you know, most of the stuff, most of the responses are actually kind of an empty cynicism, right? But I think there's some, like this is my big example, they actually surface something about about um, power in the police state and so on that I think is actually constitutes a form of image criticism. And this is the point is that these that there's um, the point is that there are new p there are new forms of of criticism with images that are already being born in already sort of vernacular. Willem Flusser, uh, a Prague-born um, uh, media theorist, writes in 1987 this book called "Does Writing Have a Future?" Um, that was 1987. Um, this is the opening page. I just think it's amusing that it's it's it begins with uh, with uh, Amelie. Uh, it begins with superscript, and the book is is weird and problematic in a lot of ways. You know, I think uh, which ways that I won't go into, but it's it's loaded with quotes about about um, about uh, the relationship between text and image and 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 the evolving nature of them. And one of the things he says, one of the arguments he makes. First of all, he makes that that what he calls electromagnetic culture or something. We're moving towards something else. We're moving towards like a, essentially a post-literate society or something like this. But then the bulk of the book is going back and looking at what alphabetic or articulated language has done. And one of the art things he makes is that before, before the kind of language, you have pictures, right? I mean, you have, you have uh, hieroglyphics or ideograms. And, that, um, and, and, and these are pictorial ways of looking and thinking about the world. And... Um, Alphabetic speech, she says, this is the quote, one writes alphabetically to maintain and extend a level of consciousness that is conceptual, superior to images, rather than continually falling back into pictorial thinking as we did before writing was invented. And so there's this idea, there's this idea that, um, that, that we have, uh, that a form of thinking and expressing yourself that forces you to order thoughts articulate them in an order, actually produces a space for critical thinking at a distance from an image, and that is precisely that. And that has formed the foundation of a lot of ways we're thinking about not just art and criticism, but the whole number of things, and that, as he says, um, uh, this the rise of a, of a more picture-based universe of a post post-literate world. He says, it leads us to a new mode of thought it can be anticipated but not yet perceived. That sounds like an assertion but is really concerned and hopeful question directed about the future. All in all, he's pretty ambiguous about it. So, as I say, I think this is a little bit of a problematic tech for all kinds of reasons. I think it's it's really, uh, that I won't go into here, um, that we could talk about it in the Q&A, but I think it does articulate a certain anxiety about what's going on wh when you, with, with the rise of a, a, an extremely image-dominated culture. Um, an anxiety that was articulated to me very well in this, this article from The New Yorker from a few months back. This is um, about this guy Emerson Spartz who runs this thing, sort of a BuzzFeed clone. They do like funny listicles and stuff um, called Dose, I believe. 
And he, he says very clear in this article that he's not interested in politics. He doesn't find the news interesting because he thinks the presentation is boring. But I asked him, you know, what, do you have any advice for people? And he says, if I were running a more hard news oriented media company and I wanted to inform people about Uganda, first, I would look it up and find out exactly what's going on there. <laughs> so, so good advice to start off. <laughs> then I would find a few really poignant images or storylines, ones that create a lot of resonant emotion, and I would make those into a short video under three minutes with clear, simple words and statistics, short declarative sentences, and at the end I'd give people something they can do, something to feel hopeful about. So some good ideas about audience engagement there, but also clearly lowering the bar for what it means to be think politically. <laughs> and I think that's the kind of, you know, it's part of that sensibilities in the air that makes people really anxious about this. Um, here's, uh, here's BuzzFeed, their article, <laughs> sent, m making mythology of, uh, of the Marxist critic Walter Benjamin, turning him into a kind of like in, uh, inspiration pinup, uh, great quotes for him. From him, not interestingly, my favorite quote: "Mankind's salvation has reached such a degree that it can experience its own aesthetic uh, destruction as an aesthetic pleasure of the first order." But you can't be perfect. So there is a way. I think you can say that the looping animated cat gif. This is a cat on a book, by the way. Um, <laughs> in some way, can stand as an allegory for exactly what F Flusser is talking about: the return to a kind of like. Uh, uh, looping, mythical thinking, uh, primal thinking that's, you know, that's outside of, that's beyond, uh, that's, that's pre almost pre-critical in a way. It's very, it hits you viscerally. Um, it's, you're kind of frozen in this kind of limbo of, 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 of pleasure. I, I'm not, not going to take that too far because, as I say, I think that we're learning new ways to think about these things. I just um, wanted to show you this gift. <coughs> Okay, so now uh, I want to talk about forms of contemporary writing that, um, forms of contemporary presenting ideas about art, um, where I think we're going, essentially. Um, so I, I, I got, um, first had these kind of, begin to have a lot of these thoughts, not thinking about my own practice, but thinking about how contemporary artists we're engaging with the internet and images on the internet. So I was teaching my students, uh, this is Artie Vierkant, and he's probably what you might call a post-internet artist. Um, and this is one of his image objects, which are essentially these um, uh, uh, images that blur the line between installation shot and some sort of abstraction. So you can't really tell whether it's a real object or not. Um, and he wrote a, um, oh goodness. Um, yeah, he wrote um, this, you know, it's become, a, it's become a, a touchstone, this manifesto called The Image Object Post-Internet that I read, and he says, um, it's right here, um, the architecture of the internet and arrangement of language, sound, and images in which imagery is the most dominant immediate factor helps facilitate an environment where artists are able to rely more and more on purely visual representations to convey their ideas and support and explanation of their art independent of language. This is a crucial point of departure from recent art history, and, arg and arguably it marks an abandonment of language and semiotics as base metaphors for articulating works of art and our relationship uh, um, to objects and culture. So that's a horrifying statement to me <laughs> as a writer. That was my first thought when I read that, is that this is like basically uh, images explaining other images, and it's like cutting me out. It's cutting out the, the critic, the cutting out the critical, the mi middleman. Um, I also think it's, well, it's, I think it's a little bit confused about what semiology is, but <laughs> it's a, uh, a side note. But I, the point is, I decided, I read this, and, and my first reaction was kind of a sort of a horror. My second reaction like, was like, well, maybe I can work with this, you know? Maybe, maybe, maybe there are forms of criticism I can come up with that um, actually uh, are a critical intervention into language that, I use, that use images against each other in order to, to um, create a form of criticism. So... You know, this was my little experiment. I, 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 I called my Instagram art reviews, and what I would do is I use the, um, the structure of Piercean semiology, um, which is the three, a three-part sign, and um, where I would the, 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 uh, the first thing, the object, would be the work of art, 
And then I would find a second thing that, you know, an association it made me to represent it. You know, what's, what's, there's an association that it produces in my head. You know, this looks like that. And then um, the third is, is the third um, aspect of the Piercean sign is the interpreting. That is like there's a signifier and a signifier, but then there's also a relationship between the two of them. They mean something together. And I thought with those three things, maybe you can take images and create a form of, of writing with images. And, and so I'll show you my modest experiments. This is, um, this is uh, a Richard Serra show at the top, a Gaussian gallery. Um, and then there's, I'm comparing it, the experience of it to Caspar David Friedrich. And then here's my third image, which is kind of a stock photo of, um, I guess I thought about the stock photos kind of signifying the, the um, industrial sublime or something like that. So you can see that it's like, here, here's the comparison it makes me think of, and here's what I think about the comparison. Here's a, here's a, a detail of a painting by Rakib Shah, which is kind of like fantastic glittery paintings. And then here is a Frank Franzetta painting, the Conan the Barbarian artist. So I'm comparing him to pulp art. And then here's, a, you know, this third is a stock photo of Chintzy, uh, Chintzy uh, cheap gems. So it's like the idea is here, it looks like pulp art, and Therefore, I think about it as sort of uh, cheap razzle-dazzle. <coughs> and here's the one that started it all. Uh, this is the girl with the pearl earring um, compared to uh, this uh, 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 famous National Geographic cover. And I guess what I, I think the visual comparison is clear, but I guess that what I was trying to get at in this loaded subject matter is I think they're both, the visual appeal of both is that they are made to seem a little bit otherworldly. Now, this was an interesting experiment for me. Uh, I learned a lot doing it. There are many others of greater or varying degrees um, of success. I learned, among other things, that it's very hard um, because, I as it turns out, uh, coming up with meaningful comparisons of images, thinking with images is just as, writing with images is just as difficult as writing, uh, or more so than writing um, with words. And I would freely admit, however, that it is a bit of um, a rack as an experiment. I mean, I, I, I don't think it succeeds in being fully clear. I might as well just put, um, I might as just probably put an uh, uh, image there that indicates, well, there's, uh, making this comparison, I'm a little bit confused about how to represent what I think about that comparison. Nevertheless, I think, I think um, you're going to see a lot more um, of this kind of thing. Not, not exactly this kind of thing, but forms of thinking with the image, inside the image. Um, critically about and within the image. Because, um, as I say, uh, uh, images have become uh, just another expressive material for people. And there are lots of examples. I, I think there are people in probably in this room doing interesting experiments with this that I don't know about. Um, Carolina was reminding me before this that, you know, uh, the Getty does Game of Thrones recaps using using works from their collection. You know, there are people doing various kinds of experimental things. I just picked out one, um, the uh, Pelican Bomb, which is a uh, New Orleans um, uh, art website and publication, um, does this series of uh, visual essays, of very visual essays. Um, this is one that takes off the, the history of the reclining female nude. So it starts with Ankh and the Grand Odalesque. And then this is presented all in a stacked ribbon in the, in the original piece but y they walk you through a sort of a history of this theme. <coughs> now, I think this is interesting and I'm excited to see more of it. I, I think it's, um, I would say it's still very primitive though, right? I mean, this is the, the essential, if you look at the way I presented the three parts of the sign, this is all essentially on the first two levels, you know, their, their, their relationship of comparison, of, uh, of difference and, um, and sameness. And it doesn't make a critical argument. And the reason I picked it for you is because I think it brings me back to ways of seeing. And people always remember, because Berger's arguments are so clear, they remember the, um, the written parts, the famous um, parts about uh, the the, his popularization of Walter Benjamin or his, his section on the male gaze. But um, there are vast sections of that book that are just images, are simply, um, the, uh, simply visual essays. Sort of, uh, and um, I think actually um, 
more sophisticated than that. This is the chapter two, which uh, takes us back to, um, which, which leads into this famous chapter on the male gaze, and you have these juxtapositions of images of women. Here's a, here's a working woman in a bakery, and behind her are images, glamour shots of, uh, of celebrities. Uh, and then here's a, uh, a woman in a car with photographers looking at her, a glamorous woman in a car with a photographer looking at her. Here's like a whole section of complex associations between, um, you know, you have this sort of, at the top, you have Picasso and Modigliani and this pinup and this kind of ecstasy. And so looking, looking at histories of like um, how sexuality is expressed, um, then you have this voluptuous pinup over here and this emaciated Giacometti that, um, that is clearly some kind of thought being produced right there about this sort of violence of, of, of the gays. Then you have these extremely uh, a page of these uh, like very sex hyper sexualized um, advertising images, and over here um, uh, Dutch still life. So creating um, talking about how the, the the language of making objects desirable are being applied to um, literally treat women like um, objects of consumption. So that's all, that's all, that's all, I mean, that's all, that's an image essay, and I, I think, I think it is not, uh, it's, it's, it's murky, you know, I think, and I think he wants it to be, I think he wants there to be significant comparisons, but also room to breathe, that's part of what the, the book is about, but I also think if you go through the book, in some ways, I think that the, the most sophisticated form of, of navigating between images and, and texts is, is, is maybe that I know maybe this book, which was produced forty some years ago. If you look at the way, here's him. He also takes off from Grand Olesque, and here's him using in incorporating it into the text of the book. Here's how he uses he uses um, uh, details of paintings to show how a narrative can be constructed out of them, and he uses uh, sophistic has a sophisticated way of looking at um, details of painting and how. Um, and how and how words, the relationship with their words and their descriptions, transform them. So here, this is a landscape of a cornfield uh, with birds flying out of it. Look at it for a moment, then turn the page. And you turn the page. It says, "This is the last um, picture that Van Gogh painted before he killed himself." It is hard to define exactly how the words here change the image, but undoubtedly they have. The image now illustrates the sentence. So I think, in a way, this is a pretty. S actually relatively sophisticated approach to the prob new problems that are emerging for us as we write online. And partly of that is because it comes out of his thinking, I mean, this is an analysis of how images function. And he's using image and text together in a sophisticated, in, a, in, a, in an elaborate way, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an involved way. Um, gotcha, I'm almost at the end. Um, come back to Turner. Um, so it's not, not for me a question of escaping images, uh, of escaping text, textuality. Um, my argument is, as I said at the beginning, that we live in a sort of hybrid state. You know, there are different modes of thinking clashing with each other. And the function of description is, of course, always uh, partly analysis. You know, you're picking out the significant things you want to describe. My argument is that once we disarticulate those two things, we think about the problem of what it means to describe around images and with images in a different and more productive way. Here's, um, here's another um, text about this the same description of this same painting by Thackeray, where he's saying, uh, he describes it very differently, and he surfaces what um, is only implicit in Ruskin's description of the painting. This is a painting about slavery. This is an abolitionist painting. It was made a to, to go up at the same time as an abolitionist show. It's a painting of the Middle Passage, essentially, and an incident inspired by an incident where 133 slaves were thrown overboard because the, the slaver wanted to collect the insurance money. And after all, Turner himself accompanied this painting with a poem that explained his meaning, which ends, hope, hope, fallacious hope, where is thy market now? So, Flusser ends his book, Subscript, the end, the counterpart to Superscript, by saying that we need to go back to kindergarten, that um, we're moving into a new world, a new way of thinking about images, and we need to relearn how we do some basic things, how we think about basic things. And, um, I began with a story of my time as a tour guide here at the Walker, and uh, 
I had forgotten, Ways of Seeing has been a very important um, reference for me as a book. Um, I had forgotten that the TV show is different than the book. It makes a different, passes to different vectors. And actually the first episode ends with John Berger showing art to children and uh, sitting with them as they describe a painting. And his conclusion is that they see it because they have a, they're, they're free of some of our habits. They have a different way of seeing it. They, they see anew. And this is a very hopeful, for me, this is a very hopeful thing. And I, I want to say that I picked this topic because I've been to enough um, art journalism conferences to know that gloom is in the air. <laughs> and there will be a lot of angst about uh, money and so on uh, and the state of the profession. But I think that you need to disarticulate the question of the economics of writing about art. And the secondary question, which is about whether we have ideas we believe in that we're presenting and whether you have ways of presenting art that excite us and feel real and lively and contemporary. I think that they're separate questions. They interpenetrate and connect. They're separate questions. So this idea for me that of, of N th thinking through the present and the potential of the present in this in a new way, I think is a very optimistic conversation that, that this, complete with its typo, you know, complete with the typo uh, where you really see Im text breaking down in relation to the Im image, is a, hopeful, it, it's a hopeful image for me. It's about new, uh, 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 it's new starting points. And for people who are looking to do something new or have the opportunity for to do something new, I think that's um, a very exciting uh, conversation to to be a part of. The question of a post-descriptive criticism, a post-descriptive criticism or post-descriptive criticism, if, if such a thing exists, is not um, simply a thing that applies to art critics, of course. It is, however, um, art criticism is about engaging with the visual. So it may be a paradigma paradigmatic mode or, or a particularly symptomatic mode or an interesting uh, site. And that means that the kind of solutions to, to the questions of how image relates to text that people come up with in order to present art have a, potentially at least, have a wider relevance to, 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 to culture. And that's not something you can say about everything that we talk about within art, which is sometimes very arcane. New ways of seeing, I think, create new ways of writing and new ways of writing about seeing. And it's on that note, that beginning, that I think is a good place for me to end this conversation and turn the conversation over to you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I've talked a long time. I don't know if there's time for questions. Are we doing... So raise your hand. How about it? Uh, There's one right here. I think they'll bring you down a microphone. Is in a Paul, give me water. Hi. Uh, so a couple presenters today, uh, at least Where two have you? used. Oh. Sorry. Yeah. Hey. Took me by surprise. Uh, have used emojis in their presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of begs the question, like when we have a Unicode standard of an agreed upon definition for an image, how can we use that to modulate written uh, information? Does that make sense? You're asking me? Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, I'll, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I don't know if I, I think that's an aesthetic and uh, intellectual problem. Uh, I think it's a more, I think emojis are a more interesting thing than people give them credit for, you know. It's um, people thinking with images, um, finding, essentially creating new, um, new, signifi new signifiers for agreed upon, you know, new languages. I think, I think they're it's a tremendously interesting um, topic, probably the subject of a lot of unreadable dissertations at this point. I mean, <laughs> they're behind the curve here. You were first, so I want you to... First of all, thank you for your talk uh, and for being so well researched. Um, I want to address something that I think is a potentially troubling takeaway from your talk, and that's that post-descriptive means post-verbal, 
Um, I think as writers, uh, you know, there's a there's definitely the uh, understanding that you know we need to work with images, we need to incorporate images in our reviews and whatever we write, but um, but replacing words entirely with with images is a kind of different project altogether. So I, I guess I'm wondering, is that um, your assignation for the future of our criticism, or would you um, would you want uh, description to be replaced by um, a discussion of context, of politics, ethics, social issues, the kinds of things that artists are concerned with in the studio? Um, is that you know, I, I guess in a way, what I'm asking is, what is the function of an art critic or an art, <laughs> an art writer in a, in a you know broad way? But <laughs> what is the function of the art critic? Um, well, there are different questions here. I mean, that that are mashed together. Part part of it, as I said at the beginning, is this is this is a, a practical talk. I mean, I actually wanted to give, do a talk here that was practical, theoretical. You know, that 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 the pass through theories of the image and theories of, of language, but that is actually, you know, I, I want people I think that this is like tremendous practical um relevance. And I don't know about you, I mean there is the problem with images is not the only problem with with uh with with um reviews, I don't think. But I I do find myself this is a cliche about internet writing, but you know, scanning reviews. I mean, I write them, you know. This is a little bit like my students when uh when uh you know we when we do crits and they like i ask them to like look for 10 minutes at their peers art and they're like can't do it you know and i'm like you guys spent 6 months in your studio making art and you can't even look for 10 minutes at your peers art and i feel the same way about uh, write, writing a lot is that i spend a lot of time you know finding the right words to um describe something and then i find myself you know scanning through things i'm like looking for the book. tell me what you think about this why should i read this you know and so there's a practical sense sense to it where i just think that like there's some function of description that um can be done better by image I th images i think that's that's obvious and um and that i think that there are intellectual hang-ups that people still have because because we're 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 still inheriting models of how to write from the past and i think a new model that's not um Post-verbal, but like that treats images and text on a on a on a on a more on more of a uh, same plane. Um, that will I think that's just happening. I mean, that's I don't think that's like that's not it's not me saying that. I think that people are doing that. I think it raises a lot of questions about um, you know uh, that's what I was trying to say about the political vectors of this. I mean, I think this raises a question where uh, it was already it was mentioned earlier in the in, in the, in the um, Earlier in the day, you know, lots of visual stories with no thought in them. That's a thing. I mean, that's that's a thing that there is demand for. Actually, is to just kind of give yourself up to the idiocy of the image. The argument that I'm trying to make is that uh, we have to be, to use a, a really um, corny uh, word, we have to be dialectical about this. It, right now, it seems to me there are like two kind of big positions playing out. There's one that are people who are like running madly in the direction of, of the visual and another one are people who are saying like, no, we we holding out for the word. And I think we need to to think through critically the problem about relating the image to the word in the new with the new um, realities. And I think that's a critical problem, right? I mean that I think that is like enlivens the task of the critic is because it's not just describing something out there, but thinking through the presentational problems of of what writing is. Uh let me see coming down here, but yeah, I, I, yeah, up, up there and then down there. So thank you so much for your talk. So uh, earlier um, we had the reference to the uh, Flannery O'Connor quote about not knowing, um, not knowing what you think until you find yourself reading it. And you yourself have referenced the sort of pedagogical situation. And I find with my own students, they have no idea what they're looking at until I force them to delineate exactly what it is they're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would be curious to hear a comment on the kind of pedagogical value of a crisis, even if it's something that may not sort of persist into the final form of professional criticism. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I think, yeah, uh, Walter is... In a certain extent, right? You know, my the the tweet, the angry tweet from my former boss, and he's saying, you know, uh, thinking about art is uh, is writing at art that begins with looking at art and writing or describing it or something like that, and that that is that is, a v in, in certain extent, um, correct, um, pedagogically, I think, and uh, um, uh, and I th the 
thing is, that's a different question than, you know, the question of how you, you know, does, do you need to, to, there are, there, there do you need to redescribe things? And, and there are some things, you know, to say, um, you know, it looks as if a bird clawed its way through, through um, white paint on the surface of this canvas. It's like a beautiful sentence that's, uh, that's uh, Frank O'Hara writing about uh, Cy Twombly, but it doesn't actually it doesn't actually do the duty of telling you telling you what it is. It's like a separate thing. It's a separate thing that you've produced. Separate and that, that separate thing has its own value. And I'm not sure I totally want to ditch it. I just think that there's a problem here that we, we that's that's being uh, that we should think about uh, down there. Um, yes, thank you very much for your talk. And you talk oh. about the separate thing that you can produce. Um, I loved your Pierce, Piercean uh, little chart, and um, how it—it's almost to me. To me, if, if I'd seen those things without your descriptions, I'm sure I would have had different uh, reactions to them. It's almost as if you were creating—you're creating something yourself. It's like you are the the artist yourself. It made me think of Warhol, um, perhaps being that's what he did. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was he wasn't creating art so much as he was, you could almost say, creating art uh, a form of criticism. Um, but I'm I'm curious what you learned from that practice. I mean, obviously you did it extensively. You thought a lot about it. What made the images when they worked successful and what didn't? Um, I'm glad you find them interesting. I I, I sort of gave up on that experiment, um, and I was excited to be able to use it um, in some kind of way here. I. Um, well, I mean, the 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 hard first of, first of all, yeah, I mean, you're you're inventing new forms of agreed upon um, structures of signification. Uh, I just think it can be done. I just think through images, you can actually can produce um, forms of thought. The, the things I learned from it were two. One is that you know the real problem thing. There is no problem in fi finding comparisons. You know, there is no problem. It's the cheapest form of criticism, actually, to say like this looks like that. Um, there is absolutely there is difficult in finding meaningful comparisons. That's where the third term comes in there. That's why I think, you know, I do I I like that little that little block because because I think it does express something. It's where the third term comes in that you that you produce a thought really, and what I found. And I think you probably all sense that when you look at those Instagram art reviews, that the third term is extremely vague, you know, because images aren't the trick. There is finding um, images that are s enough of stock images that they already function as words, or that they've already become processed into essentially a signifier. And then those aren't, you know, what do you, you yeah, it's pretty simple to find, um, you know, frowny face. If the the point of the comparison is that you you think it it makes you sad or or um, things like that, but to produce complex senses of of uh, of them requires kind of a new image lexicon. The other thing that I learned about it, which this is screamingly obvious but worth saying, is that it's not impossible to produce thoughts about something using, as Artie Vierkant says, you know, interpreting images with other images. It is very difficult to produce complex thoughts. Like if you were going to review a show in this format, you could do it. It would take like a hundred of those things to produce a series of uh, of thoughts where you compare, um, you know, different details within something to different objects and, and build that up into a, a significant thing. So as it turns out, actually, um, just old-fashioned writing is very efficient. <laughs> <laughs> for some things, you know, that's 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 one thing that I guess it's a good point to make is that part of the point is that there are some things for which images are, are more efficient and more engaging. There are some things actually like writing is more efficient. And I think that we're just in a moment where we need to clarify what those things are so that because they're getting pulped together pretty quick. We have one more minute. Ben, and I, I felt I wanted actually I didn't want it to be all guys talking. So. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, I just want to also thank you for bringing in um, John Berger's ways of seeing into superscript. I think it makes a lot of sense to bring it in. Um, and when you brought up the Van Gogh, where um, Berger talks about the image being the illustration for the writing, I thought it was really interesting to think about how much power the word has once, and also looking back at those art forums, where is 
are those artworks then becoming the illustration for the writing? You know, that in some ways, counter to what you're saying, maybe words still have a lot of power over it. when you're looking at something and then you read about it, that it alters your way of looking, which is also what he's talking about in ways of seeing, but then perhaps to think about, is it also going towards more analysis or more the content of the writing going more towards meaning making or really looking at the image in a way that isn't about description but about engaging in the art word, artwork differently. So just thinking about that. Well, leave aside the power of the image, qu the power of the word question because, um, well, I'm a writer, so I'm just going to tell you that I believe in the power of the word. But um, um, as for the uh, second uh, piece of the question, um, wait, what was the second question again? Well, I guess thinking about if um, descriptive writing is less oh, pertinent, right. thinking about analysis. I did have something to say about that. Okay. Yes. Um, um, well, look, so there is a pragmatic lesson that just, just you know, I, I have my process of as a writer and writing about things, um, when I first got my first job writing about art um, at Artnet Magazine, I, I look back on that as a kind of a golden age in a way because I had very little... Um, supervision in a way. I got to write about what I wanted and um, what I wanted to do is write reviews. And uh, my boss gave me, Walter gave me tremendous trust and and and, um, and so on. Um, and uh, what happened over the course of the years I worked there is you just start to realize that the reviews, um, while they're, they serve a great purpose, um, don't get nearly the people nearly as interested as, as, a, as something, a larger argument, analysis, um, news, um, things, like, things like this, political commentary. Um, there's just, that's, that is, and so then it does make me, make me think that, that, I mean, I think, in, in some ways, I, I'm, I'm trying to think, you know, how, uh, Criticism can function in new kinds of ways, more maybe more visual ways, uh, maybe thinking within the image, maybe thinking just taking advantage of new capacities. But uh, the other argument you can, of course, make is that the form of the review is just a historical product. I mean, there's no reason we have to be writing this way. Um, there are other forms of writing about art that we'll discover and find, and 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 uh, and and maybe it is uh, uh maybe it is 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 more you know emphasis i i do find myself you know just hungering for the like what's the point tell me tell me what you want to think tell me what you think about this um uh so maybe it is maybe maybe that's the maybe that's the solution i don't think there's one solution that's the thing is that i i think that there are there are hundreds of solutions it's an exciting moment in a way i have some excitement about what's going on right now because it's there's like clearly new um, stuff on the horizon, new ways of thinking about things, new ways of doing things. I'm not going to be able to do a lot of that. <laughs> Everyone here is. And, and so it's just very a privilege and honor to be here in front of you. And I hope we carry this conversation into the future. Thank you very much.